So my hope is that in lab, um, either the first or the second week, we can do a little um, experiment um, in trying to explore what our ancestors knew about microbiology and the processes. So one of my thought was perhaps we could try to make some kombucha tea um, or maybe some um, make our own vinegar. So we'll use the kombucha tea as a possible experiment. Um, so if we were going to make kombucha tea, which is a um, sweetened tea that's fermented by uh, a mixture of microbes, both um, yeasts and bacteria, um, first of all, we need a home to put our, our tea in, a home for our microbes, so we could get just a nice glass container here for the home. Um, the SCOBY is, is um, often referred to as a kombucha mushroom. It's not a true mushroom, but it's an actual biofilm, which we see forming here. And it stands for symbiotic community of bacteria and yeast. So we'll be using some live culture kombucha um, um, that will have all the members of the, of the SCOBY in it and then add it to the sweetened tea. Um, fermentation is a process by which the bacteria and yeast can take the sugars in the tea and convert them into um, alcohols or acids, um, possibly gases. And um, live culture kombucha tea is considered a probiotic. Probiotics are um, foods or um, liquids, beverages that we consume that have beneficial, beneficial microbes in them. And um, you might recall from our first lecture that it's thought probiotics may increase health by helping to establish a um, a healthy intestinal microbiome. And you might recall that there's some thoughts that some chronic diseases such as diabetes, cardiovascular disease, um, obesity, irritable bowel syndrome, these might be reflections of, of poorly balanced or poor microbial um, um, intestinal microbiomes. And probiotics perhaps might be one way to, to treat those conditions later. All right, so again, um, we'd want a home for our microbes. We need to give them some tea, All right? So just to introduce some of the lab terms. So the home, um, the glass jar, when we're growing our microbes in the lab, we'll be, we'll be using um, uh, sterile Petri dishes, which we'll be introducing. We'll be using um, sterile um, test tubes. And then the, t the food that we would feed our kombucha culture, which would be the tea and the sugar, we have a fancy term for microbial food. We call it media, is plural, or medium is singular. So again, we hope we can get these little kombucha cultures growing and, and um, see our own scobies develop, our own biofilms develop um, in the lab. Okay, so now we'll, we'll get down to some real lab vocabulary. So as we mentioned, the microbial homes that we use in the micro lab, um, the two types are these sterile Petri dishes. Um, or they were originally made of glass and they were reusable, but nowadays they're made of plastic. And once we use them, usually they're disposed of. And then we're gonna use glass tubes with caps. So these are gonna be two of the, the houses in which we'll put the food for our microbes and, and in which we'll um, grow our microbes. With the Petri dish, notice that the lid has a, a larger um, circumference and diameter than the bottom. The bottom is where the auger will be. Um, so we always put our microbes on the surface of the auger and the bottom of the plate. So as we mentioned, the microbial food is called medium, or the plural is media. And we'll see there's many, many different types of, of media. Um, one way to classify them is on their physical state. Are they a liquid or are they a solid? So liquid media is referred to as broth, and you can think of it just as a broth, a soup for microbes, um, containing nutrients that they need to grow. And just like you might make um, many different types of soups or broths at home, there are many different recipes for broths in the microbial lab. Um, for example, one is called triptych soy broth. This is an all-purpose um, uh, medium that we'll use to grow a wide range of um, both bacteria and fungi. Um, one that's a, what's called an enrichment medium because it's chock full of growth factors is called brain heart infusion. Now if we take our liquid broth and we add a solidifying agent to it and make a solid out of it, we call it solid medium. The most common type of solidifying agent used in microbiology is an extract of seaweed called auger. And the reason auger is used is that very, very few microbes have the 
uh, digestive enzymes to hydrolyze the auger and for that reason we can grow the microbes on the surface of the auger and it won't liquefy as they digest it. And furthermore, once the auger is solidified, it usually stays solid at relatively high temperatures, so it won't melt on us on a hot um, Sacramento day. So we can put the auger um, in different places. We can pour hot sterile auger into a petri dish. And here we see the bottom, the auger has been poured and it will solidify. So a petri dish with auger in it is often referred to as an auger plate. And these are wonderful for growing microbes aerobically. Aerobic means in the presence of air or oxygen. So we're going to be using auger plates uh, for a lot of our cultures. Um, because of the large surface area, it permits us to spread the microbes out. So they'll um, grow as individual colonies, colonies that don't touch one another. And we'll see that that's really important because an individual colony is considered a pure culture, meaning all the cells, all the microbes in that cult, in that colony um, are genetically related. They're all descended, all descended from a single microbe. Um, some mistake that folks make is when they're transferring their microbes to their auger plates, they might place the microbes on the inside of the lid. Now, recognize there's no food up there. They're going to starve. So when we transfer microbes, we want to make sure that we transfer them, we spread them over the surface of the auger. The auger is their food. Some other um, rules is, we remember when we make our labels, we always put the labels on the part of the container in which the microbes are growing. So when we are using auger plates, we're going to put the label on the bottom of the plate, right? And then what we're going to do is we're going to, um, we're going to tape the lid to the bottom of the plate so the lids actually won't fall off. We're going to invert them, which means we're going to turn them upside down, and then we'll place the plate in the incubator. One reason we invert them is that the incubators are warm and we'll have evaporation of water that will condense into water droplets on the inside of the lid. So when you go and retrieve, you pull your plates out of the incubator, the water can drop down on top of your colonies, forming a biohazardous soup that can spread all over you, all over your bench. Um, and if you have isolated colonies, that will destroy your isolated colonies and you have to start all over again. Um, this is a repeat from the first um, lab PowerPoint, but it doesn't hurt to repeat it. So if on a quiz or on a lab exam we asked you what is the um, information that needs to go on a label for your microbial culture, so remember the first is the microbe's name. So we will be, when we're using um, when we're growing bacteria or fungi, we'll be using their scientific name, so the, the genus and the species name or genus and specific epithet. We need um, your name, the first initial, and your full last name, because we have to track back the cultures to the microbiologist. We'll need the date of the culture in your lab section. So this is just an example. We'll pretend that this is a fungus fusarium, so this is the genus name. The student is L. Pasteur, Louis Pasteur. The date was August 28th of 2020 and Louis Pasteur was in the Monday Wednesday 6 a.m. lab okay and again we're going to put the labels on the bottom of our plates um, with our auger plates if you have a permanent fine tip marker you can label the outside put all the label information around the outside and the reason you want to do that is that you don't want your label to cover up um, interesting aspects of, of your colonies of your microbes that will be growing so this is the this is the bottom of the plate and this is the top of the plate. And it just struck me here, this fusarium, this might be the contaminant I have growing in my home kombucha culture. Um, I'm going to bring in a sample of, of our contaminated kombucha culture and let's see if we can find out who that contaminant is. But it looks a lot like this fusarium. Interesting. Um, and this is, this is just giving you a little bit of background on these samples. Um, these were samples of um, contact lens solution or, and, and samples from contact lenses. These are from patients who developed an inflammation of the conjunctiva, the, um, inflammation of the cornea, keratitis, which can be really serious. So, so keratitis, inflammation of the cornea of the eye. And what they discovered was the, the contact lenses and I believe some of the content, contact lens soaking solution was contaminated, contaminated with this opportunistic pathogen, this fusarium species. So they isolated the fusarium from the eyes of the patients with a fungal keratitis from cultures, 
from the contact lenses, from the cases, and the lens soaking solution. So this is just an example of how we can use our um, auger plates to do a little bit of microbial detective work. And this is, um, this is the bottom of one of the auger plates that was inoculated from the fluid from the contact lens case. And this is the top. So you can see that this is the top of the colonies, these fungal colonies. This is the bottom. And indeed, when we're identifying fungal colonies, often the appearance um, of the bottom of the colonies is helpful with the appearance of the colonies on top. So again, hopefully we're going to get to see some examples of this when we do a little bit of microbial sampling in the lab. So in addition to petri dishes and auger plates, another place we can grow our microbes are in glass um, sterile tubes. We'll put our media in the tubes, and that could be either sterile broth, liquid, or we could put auger in these tubes. But really important, folks, is that in our lab, we, our tubes all have these screw cap tubes, so you can twist them and make them so no air can escape. But this is really dangerous, because once we inoculate your... Um, your broth tubes or auger slants or auger deeps with your microbes, when they start growing, they're going to make lots and lots of gas. And if you tighten the cap, that gas is going to build up so that when you go to move the tubes, if you knock them gently even, um, that could cause the, um, the tube to explode in your hand. And it can cut your hand, it could explode in your face and, and um, um, you know, damage your eyes, damage your face. So we want to remember that we always, always, when, we're, uh, when we have microbes growing in these tubes, is that when we incubate the tubes, or if we put the tubes in our lockers, or when, very importantly, when we put the tubes in the kill area when we're finished using them, we always, always want to just barely loosen these caps so that they can vent, so that gases can escape, and we won't have this um, buildup of gas pressure inside. We don't want these tubes acting as little mini hand grenades. Um, just really quickly here, this little cartoon. Um, this could be a liquid broth, okay? So this could, we could call this a broth tube. Um, both of these are showing us auger um, that's been poured into the tubes, and then we can let the auger solidify with the tubes at different angles. So these would be auger slants, this one and this one. Um, and usually what we do is we inoculate the surface of the slant here so the microbes can grow aerobically. We can use a needle and stab the butts to get the microbes growing anaerobically in the butt. And again, in the, I think the previous, or the back tea incinerator um, PowerPoint video, I made a mistake. So when we stab the butts of our slants, oops, sorry, well, oh, here we go. <laughs> if we were to stab the butts, of our auger slants, or if we were to stab the butt of an auger deep. This is an anaerobic area, so anaerobic meaning no air, no oxygen. So we stab the butts to force our microbes to grow anaerobically. We do that with our needles, and then we would, oops, we would streak the, um, the surface of the slant here um, so that our microbes can grow aerobically. And these are just some um, examples of a type of slant that we'll be working with called TSI and you can see this is one of the totally fun things about microbiology is we use all kinds of indicators, our media turn different colors and the colors will give us important clues as to the identity of our microbes. Okay. And this is auger slants and this was just my attempt at showing an auger deep. So again where do the labels go? So when we're using any kind of tube and the microbes are growing in the tube, the label always goes on the body of the tube, the body of the glass tube in our case. Never put the labels on the caps because caps can fall off or they can get mixed up. How do we move our microbes from one place to another? Or we could say, how do we um, transfer our microbes from one place to another? Um, another way of saying that, how do we inoculate our media if we're going to um, put them in contact with, with microbial media so they can grow? So there's a number of different transfer instruments that, that we can use in the lab. One is a sterile cotton swab, and we'll probably do this when we do some microbial environmental sampling, maybe week one or week two. Um, we can have transfer pipettes that can transfer fluids. These are usually little plastic pipettes. Um, in our lab, we're going to use inoculating loops. This will probably be the most frequently used inoculating tool, and we'll also be using inoculating needles if we want to stab auger butts to get our microbes to grow anaerobically. And then we probably won't be using these little spreaders, but this is a way to take 
um, a relatively large volume of fluid that has microbes in it and spread it over the surface of an auger plate. Here's a spreader. Here is an inoculating needle. And here's an inoculating loop. And again, just an example, um, and we can do this later when we start looking at um, blood auger plates. We can use sterile cotton swabs, take a, a throat sample, or maybe a sample from a nose, or again, you can use throat swab, excuse me, you can use cotton swabs to take environmental samples, and then you simply spread the microbes over the surface of the plate. And we'll, we will be doing this when we try to figure out what's causing um, the contamination of our kombucha culture. You'll be using sterile swabs to take some of the kombucha color, excuse me, kombucha tea, and spread it over the surface of our auger plates, and then we'll see what will grow. One of the most important skills that we can learn in microbiology is aseptic or sterile techniques. So a aseptic or sterile techniques are procedures we use to prevent contamination of our instruments, our media, our cultures, and most importantly, our patients with unwanted microbes. So. Um, Aseptic, sur aseptic surgical techniques are techniques we use, again, to prevent our uh, patients from getting infected during surgery, and sometimes that can be um, uh, life-threatening. So there's several procedures for good aseptic techniques. So um, one starts when we sterilize all of our media, all of our tubes, um, and our instruments using the autoclave. And we'll be talking about autoclave conditions, and we will point out that um, normal autoclaving will destroy any pathogenic microbe except for disease-causing prions, and that's a nightmare. In the autoclave, moist heat is used under pressure to kill all cellular microbes. This is important. It will destroy all bacterial endospores. So if we had botulinum endospores or anthrax endospores or tetanus endospores, autoclaving would destroy them and normal autoclaving will also destroy all viruses, so that's important. And again, we just want to stress, you need to remember, normal autoclaving will not destroy disease-causing prions, and that's a nightmare for the hospitals and dental offices. So this is, these are the, um, the conditions for a normal autoclave run. These are conditions you'll want to memorize for our lab quizzes, our lab exams. So an average normal autoclave run is 121 degrees Celsius at 15 pounds per square inch of pressure above atmospheric pressure. And then depending on whether it's um, solids or liquids or, um, say, instruments, it'll be 15 to 20 minutes. And again, these conditions will destroy all pathogens except who won't be destroyed? Those doggone disease-causing prions. So we're going to start out with sterile media, sterile um, auger plates, sterile um, broth tubes and um, um, auger slants and broth tubes. But now we want to move, transfer, inoculate our microbes, move them into where the food is in that sterile container. So our transfer instruments also have to be sterile. So as, as we mentioned earlier, we probably most of the time we're going to be using our inoculating loop. So here we have an inoculating loop. And this part, this wire portion that's been twisted into a loop, this is the part that you want to sterilize. And this is the part that you'll use to touch your microbial cultures, pick up some microbes. And then you'll use your loop to spread your microbes um, over your auger plates or over the surface of a slant or into a broth tube. Now, these Bacti incinerators, what we'll do when we're going to use them, we'll have you turn them on. And it'll take about five minutes for the inside of this barrel to become incredibly hot. And once the Bactine incinerator is hot, what we'll do is using the handle, only the handle, <laughs> this end of our um, inoculating loop, we'll insert only the wire portion of the loop into the barrel here. Don't insert the portion where we have the junction between the wire and the handle. Um, the temperature is so high that we have metal fatigue and we've had the wire portion of the loops fall off in the Bacti incinerator. So we're just going to put this maybe two-thirds of the um, wire portion of the loop into the barrel. And it's amazing because the um, manufacturers say that within five to ten seconds of holding your loop inside the hot Bacti incinerator, every um, microbe should be incinerated. And indeed, you guys, if we had disease-causing prions, 
on the tip of this loop and we left them in there long enough, they would be incinerated. So this truly would even destroy uh, the disease-causing prions. It's really important that when you withdraw your loop after you've heated it, don't put it down on the bench top, don't put it down on paper because uh, it will be so hot it could melt the bench or it could ignite the paper. We had a bench top paper fire last semester when a person took a hot loop and laid it down on a paper towel and it started a fire. It's important that you let the loop cool before you touch your microbes because if the loop is still really really hot and you touch your microbes you're gonna kill them and then whenever you finish transferring your microbes you always re-sterilize the loop or your needle so if in doubt just re-sterilize again. Uh, one last thing we had one person burn themselves last semester because they didn't realize that this portion of the handle would also be hot. So be careful, you guys. This It might be this whole half of the loop or needle will be hot. So only handle the loop or the needle at the very end here so you don't get burned. Okay, And we will demonstrate this. And there is a short little um, video on the back to incinerator use. I think in, it was in lab unit one, um, or excuse me, on canvas, the lab unit one um, unit. So we want, because we don't, we don't have a lot of time in lab and we don't have that many weeks, we need our microbes to uh, grow and divide rapidly. And to do that, we want to keep them warm. So with, after you inoculate your microbial cultures, we're going to have you incubate them. And we have two, two different incubators in the micro lab, one's set at 30 degrees Celsius. So this is used usually for um, growing um, fungi or environmental microbes. And then the second incubator, oops, the second incubator is set at 37 degrees Celsius, and this is the normal core body temperature of humans. So if you're trying to grow human pathogens, human, human bacteria, usually we want to incubate at 37 degrees Celsius. Unfortunately, um, some of the incubators look like refrigerators or freezers. So make sure when you want your microbes to grow and keep them warm, don't accidentally put them in the refrigerator or the freezer because if we keep them cold, they aren't going to grow. Knowing how to properly deal with the waste we generate during a lab exercise is really important. So anything that could have microbial contamination will go into, at the end of benches one, two, and three, there's um, biohazard bins, autoclave bins. Um, anything that we think is contaminated with microbes will go into the autoclave or biohazard bins. Um, make sure when you open the bin that you see that there is a bag inside. Don't throw them into the bins unless there's an autoclave bag inside. Um, this would include used auger plates, any contaminated paper, your gloves. This is really hard to get people to do. When you um, finish using your gloves, put them in the autoclave bag, not in the regular trash. We don't want to contaminate the people that help us clean up the lab. However, you never want to put glass nor pipettes in nor glass pipettes in the biohazard bins. So glass, um, pasture pipettes, glass pipettes will go into either the sharps container or we'll have a, a separate tub in the kill area with an autoclave bag for, um, for example, for glass serological pipettes. The sharps container in the kill area is for all glass slides, cover slips, and pasture pipettes. The kill area is in the very back of the lab, right next, next to the autoclave room. And you'll see that there's two, two big tubs or two big bins um, with test tube racks in them. One of the tubs is for tubes of auger, so auger slants or auger deeps. The second tub is for tubes containing um, broth culture. So please, please try to make sure you get your used cultures in the right place. And again, this is so important that we always slightly loosen the caps of the tubes before placing them in the kill area. We don't want them acting as little um, mini hand grenades. The slide warmers are at the ends of benches one, two, and three, and these will become really important in chapter eight, unit eight, when we make our um, bacterial smears and start staining. Um, in some labs, they set the slide warmers so high that it, the, um, the slide warmers can actually be used to fix the cells to the surface of the slide. We try not to um, have the slide warmers set so high that they're going to heat fix the cells because we don't want them to distort the shapes while a lot of um, liquid is present. So instead what we'll do is we'll use clothespin as slide holders and just hold the dried smears um, against the outside barrel of the back tea incinerator and that will fix the cells 
to the glass surface. So make the cells stick to the glass surface of the slide so that when we add our stains and our dyes, the cells won't wash off. So we will be exploring, just as, as, a, as a way to see how we use some of these equipment and some of these tools, we're going to try to um, explore which microbes are growing in our kombucha tea. So we've got um, one tea batch that we don't think is contaminated, but we have a second batch that is contaminated, I think, with a fungal environmental um, fungal contaminant. So we'll try to figure out who it is. Um, we'll try growing the teas on our auger plates, on different types of auger plates, and then we'll also be using our microscopes to see if we can identify who the contaminating microbe is. Okay, so I think that ends this one. Our, our, the next unit we'd be covering is the metrics unit, chapter three or unit three, and probably the best way for us to do that is we'll use the practice metrics exam in your lab packet and we'll do some um, examples, some samples in lab. Um, also be aware that the math lab has math tutors available. Okay, and Khan Academy, K-H-A-N, um, Khan Academy has some really outstanding tutorials in all kinds of subjects. They're really good at math, chemistry, um, biology. Okay, we'll be talking to you in lab soon.